Their mission, to enforce a delicate political agreement, hoping to bring an end to the most protracted and bloody conflict Europe has seen since the Second World War. Armed to the teeth with the latest in high-tech weaponry, these combat warplanes are a sobering reminder of the striking force of modern air power. The high cost of air power means that today's air forces have to be very careful about the number and type of aircraft they purchase. With commitments around the globe, the U.S. Air Force requires a sizable fighter force. Today, it has almost 90 tactical fighter squadrons with nearly 1,500 fighters. Two fighters have formed the backbone of these fighter squadrons, the F-15 Eagle and the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Both aircraft were designed in the 1970s and both matured into their current variants during the 1980s. As a result of its sheer size, the U.S. Air Force decided to buy a mixed fighter force of F-15s and F-16s as the best balance of economy and capability. The F-16 sits at the low end of this high-low mix. It is a much smaller aircraft than the F-15 and also much less costly. The reasons for this are immediately apparent. The F-16 is powered by a single jet engine. The F-15 has two. This reduces the original purchase cost and makes it cheaper to operate. But this should not be misunderstood to mean that the F-16 is a low-performance aircraft. To the contrary, the F-16 has a formidable combat record in the air battles over Lebanon, over Iraq, and in a series of small wars and border incidents around the globe. The single-seat F-16 is the essential fighter adaptable to a wide range of missions and a wide range of weapons. The F-16 gives you more bang for the buck than probably any airplane on the market. It will carry almost any form of ordnance you want to hang on it. Uh, you punch it all off, you've got a great dogfight, you hang it all on, maybe you can drop some bombs or uh, attack a ground target. So for the amount of money you put into it, you have an enormous amount of capability, whereas some, most nations really can't afford the larger fighters we fly, like the F-14 or the F-15. This versatility means that the F-16 can be used for many different types of air combat. In its basic fighter role, the F-16 is armed with the latest missiles. On its outer wingtips is the world's most sophisticated air-to-air -air missile, the AMRAAM, designed to give the F-16 the upper hand in a dogfight with any other fighter. Past generations of radar-guided missiles depended on the fighter aircraft to guide them to the target. The fighter's radar was aimed at the enemy fighter and the missile honed in on this electronic signal. But this meant that the fighter could not maneuver while the missile was still in flight, leaving it vulnerable to attack. And it could only attack one enemy target at a time. The AMRAM was designed to allow the pilot to turn off the fighter's radar and still engage targets. This protects the fighter from being detected from its own radar and then targeted by an enemy's air-to-air anti-radiation missiles. While still very far away, the fighter locates the enemy with its radar and can turn the radar off. The pilot then feeds the target coordinates from the fighter's computer into the missile computer. The missile locks on and the fighter launches the missile. The fighter can then turn as much as 40 to 50 degrees off the target periodically turning its radar back on, relocating or painting the enemy fighter, then downloading the data to the missile while it heads to the target. 12 miles from the enemy, the missile's own radar turns on and locks on for final guidance. The missile impacts while the fighter is already preparing to launch another missile at a second enemy aircraft. The F-16's versatility makes it ideal for the strike fighter mission. It can attack targets in the air and on the ground. Operation Desert Storm demonstrated the effectiveness of new fighters outfitted with the latest strike weapons, precision-guided munitions and smart bombs. Newer versions of the F-16 are fitted with the advanced Lantern night attack system, allowing the F-16 to attack targets at night or in bad weather conditions. This targeting pod has two functions it gives us. One is it turns uh, basically night into day. It gives us a, a 
IR image up in the cockpit of the target area we're looking at. So I can get, um, even in the, when it's pitch black outside, I can get almost what looks like a day image, but it's in the IR spectrum of the target area, and that will help me then to guide bombs in. The second thing it does is there's a laser. And so I can fire a laser, and then my bombs can follow the laser spot on down to the target. The Bosnian peacekeeping missions put the versatility of the F-16 to the test. Unlike outright warfare, peacekeeping missions are difficult to plan. The fighters may be attacked by enemy fighters, or they may be called on to carry out a mission against ground targets. So these F-16s are equipped with a remarkable array of weapons to cover all contingencies. They are armed with AMRAAM missiles for dogfighting on their outer wing pylons. Under the wings are Maverick ground attack missiles, harm anti-radar missiles, or bombs. The epitome of modern interceptor aircraft is the F-15 Eagle. While the F-16 was designed for a multiplicity of missions, the F-15 is a specialist in air-to-air -air combat. It is much larger than the F-16 in order to carry a bigger and more powerful radar, as well as a heavier missile payload. It has one primary mission, attaining air superiority over the enemy air force. It accomplishes this mission with a full range of missiles, including the short-range Sidewinder, the medium-range Sparrow, and the beyond-visual-range AMRAAM. The F-15 has greater range, greater payload, greater speed, and a much more powerful radar than the F-16. But these features come at a price. While an F-16 costs about $18 million, the F-15 is nearly double that cost, about $35 million. For years, the U.S. Air Force's main all-weather attack aircraft has been the F-111. But the F-111 is old with some of the fleet in service for almost 30 years. Instead of designing a whole new fighter to replace the 111, the Air Force decided to adapt the F-15 to this role. The result is the F-15E Strike Eagle, which, unlike the single-seat fighter version, is a two-seater. In the back seat is the weapons officer, whose task is to navigate to the targeted area and then aim the precision-guided attack weapons against the targets. The Strike Eagle can also perform as a fighter plane, but its specialty is to attack pinpoint ground targets in any type of weather. Because it has longer range and a larger ordnance payload than the F-16, the F-15 is used as a deep strike aircraft, able to attack targets deep into enemy territory. The Navy follows the Air Force pattern almost exactly with two fighter types, the Hornet and the Tomcat. The Hornet is the Navy's equivalent of the F-16. It is officially codenamed the F-A-18, the F standing for fighter and the A standing for attack. Like the F-16, it is a jack of all trades, equally effective for fighter missions or ground attack. You can't fill an entire carrier with aircraft the size of an F-14. It's just not affordable. Um, for that reason, the Navy has gone to a smaller um, multi-role aircraft that can swing between air defense and uh, strike missions, the F-18 Hornet. Navy aircraft operate in an environment which calls for much more durable and expensive aircraft than the Air Force needs. For example, the Navy's Hornet has two engines compared to the Air Force's F-16's single engine. The reason is simple. Navy aircraft operate far out at sea, and if a single-engine airplane suffers an engine problem, it has no hope of making it back to the carrier. But if a twin-engine plane like the Hornet loses an engine, it can make it back to the carrier on just its remaining engine. The Hornet also has to survive the stress of carrier launches and landings. The catapult launches take a heavy toll on its delicate electronics. And carrier landings are often described as controlled crashes, with 18-ton aircraft slamming onto the deck of a ship at speeds well over 100 miles per hour and going from 125 miles an hour to zero in a matter of seconds. Needless to say, such enormous forces require an exceptionally rugged airframe. 
This ruggedness comes at a high cost. A cost that 